this lecture, we're going to apply our setting terms to a poem. In particular, Robert Browning's My Last Duchess. So let's start with the general setting. We know from the footnote that's at the beginning of the poem that the action of the poem is actually set about 300 years before when the poem is written in 1842. It's based loosely on the story, the historical story of a duke in Italy in the mid 16th century. So those are elements of the general setting and they can give us some insights into some of the events within the poem itself. That's why this general setting is important. So for example, we know by the end of the poem that the speaker, the Duke, is warning that he had his first wife killed and telling the story about his first wife to the family of the girl that he wants to marry next. So it may seem odd that he could tell this story, but once we understand that time period of the mid 16th century when this poem is set, it makes a little more sense because in mid 16th century Italy, the Duke would have been the law of the land as the um, wealthiest and highest titled person in his neighborhood. So when, if there was some transgression of the law, it actually would have been brought to the Duke to solve. Basically that means that he himself is above the law and doesn't have to worry even about murdering his wife. So just that general setting information alone gives us some important information that helps us to understand some events in the plot. In terms of the temporal setting, there's a really significant um, framework of two different time periods that are functioning in this text. There's this uh, present day of the poem where the Duke is speaking to the representative of the family of the girl he wants to marry next, and that's sort of the outer frame of the of the story, if you will. And then there's the story within a story where the Duke is talking about his past wife and talking about these memories he has and representing her in specific ways. So there are these two different time periods in the poem that correlate to this sort of outer frame and inner frame, and you can find out more about those in the plot section of the unit, um, that function throughout the poem. So that's a good example of temporal setting. And that helps us to understand the structure of the poem. And, it, and we also need to keep in mind what things are present and what things are past. So in this particular text, temporal setting functions in relation to the structure of the narrative. Finally, let's talk about physical setting in this text. And physical setting is really interesting in this one. So in that present day of the poem, the Duke, the speaker, and his um, audience, and in this case, as we talked about, it's, it's a representative of the family of the girl he wants to marry next. Um, they're standing in what, what seems to be his, his art gallery. So at the end of the poem, we get a sense that there's a statue there, uh, the Neptune, that's a seahorse cast in bronze. Um, and then of course, the most important element of the physical setting is what we start the poem with, and that is the portrait of his first wife, of the Duchess on the wall. So, so there's, there's just that element, the idea that she's been memorialized in this portrait. He uses that portrait as an occasion to tell the story uh, about her that's going to be the warning to the next um, potential wife. And, and then let's think a little bit even further about some of the details of that portrait. So we get the sense, and, and again, we've got to do a little bit of uh, detective work with the lines in the poem. So let's, let's go take a look at the, the beginning lines of the poem here. Um, I call that piece a wonder. Now Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you to sit and look at her? So this is where, opening in the, in the text, they've just come and apparently are in front of this picture, and the Duke himself describes it as a wonder and he asks his uh, listener to sit down and take a look. And then here's the reaction apparently of the listener. We can infer it based on what the Duke says. I said for a panel by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I've drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. Okay, so there's two, two pieces there, one in the parenthetical statement, we'll set that aside for the moment, and then the other one is just the description of the picture itself. Again, by inference, he's sort of reporting back what he's hearing from his listener. Never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself, they seemed, as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. 
In other words, what, what that's saying is everyone who looks at this picture turns and says to me, the Duke, why does she have that look on her face, right? And it's a look of um, passion. It's an earnest glance. That's how it's described in the poem. So first of all, is the, the painting itself, the look on the face of the Duchess is remarkable. It, it causes people to have questions. And so the Duke is sort of ready for this um, questioning and has an answer and the answer constitutes the rest of the poem. So that's the first thing that the, uh, the painting itself has this distinctive look um, that, that causes people to wonder. So that's one element of the physical setting. And then the other thing is, let's look at that parenthetical. Since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I. So apparently in its normal state, just sitting in the gallery, this painting is covered up with a curtain. And the only one allowed to draw that curtain is the Duke. That's a really important element of the physical setting. And, and it's a small detail, but a significant one. This portrait exists with the curtain drawn in front of it. And as we read through the poem, we learn that the Duke is extremely controlling of his wife. And in particular, what upsets him about her is that she looks at other things and other people besides him and experiences joy and pleasure. So, you know, he talks a lot about how her looks went everywhere and that's around line 24. Sir, was all one, my favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. First of all, we have a bunch of other settings. There are a bunch of other elements of setting that cause uh, the Duchess to be happy, right? And causes her to smile. Um, but also the fact that she's looking at these things and being pleased and smiling and having, having that reaction upsets him because to him, it seems insulting. It is as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name, and this is around line 33, my, my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. He doesn't like her looking at other things and other people and experiencing that pleasure. What happens? This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. So, you know, again, we get that warning that he had her killed or killed her. Now, back in the present day of, the, of him telling this story, we see that he has her painting where she's looking out at viewers, but he keeps it covered up. This curtain allows him to control her gaze. What he wanted to do in life but couldn't, he now can do now that she's been turned into this object of the painting, and he can put this curtain in front of it, and he is the only one who is allowed to draw that curtain and reveal her face, or you could think about it as drawing that curtain and allowing her to look out. As we can see, there are lots of significant elements of setting in this poem, from the general setting to particulars of the physical and temporal setting.